much for your help. You can go ahead and be seated. Wow, praise the Lord. Isn't he good? Well, we're going to continue singing, and I have invited just a couple other children um, to stay up here and praise the Lord. And we, we've talked a lot about this and why we're singing and why we have um, microphones in our hands. And this is simply just to, to lead. But we lift high the name of Jesus with one voice here in this place. And there is joy here. Amen. It is good and it is right that we would look at these children and, and that they would bring smiles to our faces. There's joy here and it comes from the Lord. He is good in this place and let's just continue to worship him this morning.
I kind of emphasized that we practice a lot and that is so that hopefully what we practice all of us just kind of flows um, without thinking too much about it so that our minds and our hearts as we sing and worship with our congregation can be focused on what we're actually singing. <laughs> Not that our practice isn't worship but those are kind of the dis distinctions and so I was as I was telling these kids that I, I was just kind of asking them about this next song we're singing the goodness of God and I asked each of them if they would share how God has been good to them how they experience the goodness of God so um, would you guys take a moment and, and share with our congregation how has God been good to you Palmer do you want to go first oh, okay. <laughs> um, that I could get a new house and get a new dog I mean, like, he, everything has a purpose, and God created everything, so everything is good. Everything is awesome. Praise the Lord. Um, just we're a really wonderful family and friends and community. Praise the Lord. 
Awesome. God has been so good. I'll share with you right now, here in this space, I see the goodness of God everywhere. As we lift our voice in, in song, the goodness of God is here in this place. Let's continue worshiping. Love you, Lord. And we can see answered prayers where God has stepped into your life, a place where he's shown up just in time. And sometimes it's easy to forget that. And maybe things in your life are going maybe not so according to plan right now. But look around and, and you can see the, the moments where God has shown up in, in our lives as a faith family. And it's a reminder for us. He's going to continue to be faithful. He knows what you're going through. There's nothing you're experiencing that's a surprise to him. There's nothing you're going through right now that's caught him off guard. You ever imagine God saying, oh, I didn't think that, oh, I didn't realize that was happening. He doesn't do that. He knows. Not only does he know, he's already at work. He's already doing things that maybe we have not yet seen or understand or see. We may never see, but he's faithful, he loves you, and he's chasing after you. As we go to prayer this morning, we did this a few weeks ago, we're going to open up our altars. Perhaps you just want to come. 
If you feel God chasing after you because you don't know how to pray, just come and say thank you. Thank you tends to open up the doorways to worship. Thank you tends to, to free us of those burdens that are weighing us down. And if you don't know what to pray for today, begin by saying, Lord, thank you. So as we do that chorus again, we do that again, chorus again. And we're going to just open up our altar. Perhaps you just want to come and just spend some time with a God who's chasing after you. Maybe you have something heavy you're dealing with. Or there's an answer you're waiting on. I've got an answer I'm waiting on. Maybe hopefully I can share that in a couple of, of weeks. But God has been reminding me consistently these last couple of days. That it's not a surprise to him. He knows what's happening. But my wife and I need God to do something. That Well, we think we'd like him to do something. Maybe he's got other plans, right? We've got to surrender ourselves to that as well. So whatever's going on in your life right now, you have a God that loves you. He's waiting for you. We sing that chorus again. Perhaps you just want to come. Let's prepare our hearts for prayer this morning to worship a God who is good, who is chasing after us this morning. goodness of God. Yes, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. How we begin today, our time of prayer, is acknowledging how good you are remembering how good you have been. And with confidence, Lord, believing you'll continue to be good in our days ahead. Lord, we lift up your name. That's what worship is. That's what worship does. It puts you in the right place. puts us in the correct posture. Too often, Lord, we approach you with kind of the give me's the Lord do for me for the bless me and I think as we walk closer to, with you and know who you are we recognize that those are things we don't have to ask for because you are a good God who, who, who delights in giving good gifts to his children to those who know him and even this morning Lord those who know you they recognize those parts of our, of our lives where you're involved even when he doesn't seem readily noticeable. I can't help but think there's some here today just wondering, praying, asking, Lord, when are you going to show up? Lord, do you hear me? God, I need you. Do you remind us today, Lord, there's nothing that surprises you. We can trust you. You are good. You are faithful. I pray today as we've had a chance to worship with your children, our children today, Lord, that as they get ready to prepare to go back to school, that you would help them get ready. Be with the parents, Lord, as they sometimes are anxious during this time, sometimes they're excited. For the teachers, those who influence our children. God, prepare them, give them rest. Pray for protection. For the marriages in this church, Lord, this morning. I pray, Father, you would help those who need a little encouragement. Remind us of the commitments we've made, not only to one another, but to you. Restore that which might be fractured. Humble us, Lord, if we need to be humbled. Help us be willing to say we're sorry if, if that needs to, there's reconciliation that's required. God, move in our homes today, I pray. For those that are facing physical challenges, Lord, or maybe diagnosis they don't like or, or, or find themselves in the midst of treatment that they're unsure of, I pray, God, today that you would just, as a great physician, step in. Remind us that, Lord, you, you are at work. We pray for a physical touch. Lord, Lord your word commands us to, to lift up, to pray, to lay hands upon those who need prayer. Lord, we do that this morning. Pray for the one, Lord, who feels alone. 
feels like they're lost, for the anxious, the discouraged, the depressed. Of all places where a person should not feel that way, it's it's within a church, a place, Lord, where all are invited to come and belong. We're all through the grace of God can be redeemed and welcomed into relationship. We thank you, Lord, for the early days we've shared together. You're up to something. We recognize it. We, we see it, Lord. We want to be a part of it. But I pray that we would be a people that consistently uh, surrenders ourselves to your will. Lord, that we would continue to seek out the plans that you have for us. And Lord, when, when those moments come, as we're going to talk about today in your word, we wouldn't have to question. We would just know. And Lord, no matter how incredibly uh, bodacious of a prayer it might be, that we would be willing, as you speak to us, Lord, to faithfully, to obediently follow. Because, Lord, if, if we're relying upon uh, ministry based on our own talents and abilities or what we can do, Lord, then we are selling ourselves and our community far short of how good and how great you are. So, Lord, come. We are glad you're here. Speak to us, your people. Young and old alike, as we gather together this morning, we're, we're going to share a story that's familiar to all ages today. But there's a message for us in, in this timeless tale, the, the, this biblical account, that, that maybe we can take something new home with us. So Lord, stretch us, challenge us, change us. Every time in your word, when you show up, people are changed. They either draw closer to you or they walk further from you. Today, Lord, I pray we would choose to walk towards you. Lord, you know every need that's represented here today, every burden, every request the people that are bringing to you now. Receive them, God. This is our offering. We come as flawed and broken people. But we've come to the right place. We have a loving Heavenly Father ready to receive all that we are and all that we're not use it for his own glory. Father, we give our lives to you. We give this time to you. Have your way with us, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, good morning. If my face is unfamiliar to you, I am Mara Castle. I'm the children's director here. So most Sundays, I am upstairs worshiping with your kids. And can I just tell you again, just what a gift it is, though, when our kids get to worship with you, too. These are some of my favorite Sundays. This past couple of weeks, we've sent large groups of kids off to summer camp. So any of the kids that went to summer camp this summer, if you guys want to join me up on stage, you guys will get to admire their beautiful tie-dye shirts, which when I saw them on the last day, so many of these, I'm like, they are so reflective of some of their personalities. You have up here the kids that there's never enough of the dye, and then you have the ones that are so precise, and they just wanted to get it just right. And I think their shirts turned out pretty good. What do you guys think? So this summer, we had the privilege of sending 22 campers from first grade through sixth grade, and we had eight counselors that agreed to go from our church. So these are counselors, these are adults and teens who took time off from jobs, who took time away from work, who spent time investing in our kids. And we thought it was important to share this with you and to show you some of these great pictures because as a church, you guys invest in our kids. We always pay half of the registration fee for any kid who wants to go to summer camp. So you guys are making an investment in what they do at camp. Uh, we have a couple of, 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 we have a video to share with you, and Allie's going to share uh, just a little bit about what it's been like to transition from being a camper and going to camp to this year was her first year as a counselor. But every one of these kids has stories to tell. So if you see a kid in tie-dye this morning and you want to hear a little more about camp, I invite you to, to ask them. But I'm going to turn the mic over to Allie. Uh, so as Pastor Mar said, uh, my name is Allie Clements, um, and I used to be one of these kids. Um, I actually went to this camp first through sixth grade, uh, which I think is like six summers. I don't, I don't really know, but I was able to go back this year uh, as a junior counselor. And just for reference, I'll be going into my junior year of high school, so this camp has been a part of my life for a very, very long time. Uh, when I originally signed up to go to this camp, I thought I was going with our own kids. I thought I was going to go with our preteen kids, uh, but d- uh, the, the director, uh, Pastor Missy, actually had asked me to, you know shift into working with girls that I had no idea who they were. 
um, which I'm not gonna lie, pushed me completely out of my comfort zone. Like to be going to a place um, I hadn't been in a long time to working with kids I had no idea, you know, that's, that's scary. Uh, but as the kids learn this week, like being pushed out of your comfort zone, it's okay. That's what brings us closer to fellow believers and helps uh, us grow in Christ. So um, having gone to this camp as a kid and making memories that will last me a lifetime, saying I was excited to come back and share this experience with other kids is an understatement. At this camp, I was able to build relationships with not only fellow believers, but my relationship with Christ. I actually accepted Christ at one of these camps. Um, and getting to watch these kids do the same thing was the highlight of my summer. Um, getting to go back and relive my experiences caused so many emotions, but no emotion topped the joy I felt watching these kids kneel at the altar and accept Jesus into their lives. They were able to show their fellow believers how on fire for the Lord they are, I'm also excited to know that some of our older kids are planning to return as counselors themselves next year. I am beyond grateful for this opportunity the Lord has provided and excited to see what happens in years to come. All right, and I'm going to leave you with one last video. This is um, Jillian Nurk. She's one of our sixth graders moving into seventh grade, and she is just one of those kids that's just near and dear to my heart. And as I got to pick her up from camp and we're driving home, um, she was just telling me about this is only just one of many stories of what she experienced at camp this year. And she wasn't able to be here this morning, but I didn't want you guys to miss out on this. Hi, I'm Jillian, and last week I went to preteen camp. The theme of the week was running your race throughout your life, and... One night we talked about when Jesus called Peter out on to walk on the water and when Peter started doubting, um, he started sinking, but Jesus' hand was immediately there. That same night we were called to go to the altar and I went to the altar and I started praying, I can't run my race by myself, Jesus. I need your hand. And the praise team was singing over us as we were praying at the altar. As soon as I took a second to breathe, the lyrics of the song were, I'm here with my arms stretched out wide open. I'm listening, I'm available. And I have a lot of the time, a hard time um, hearing Jesus speak to me. And that was kind of just instinct. You know that it was God. And that was an experience and memory I will always remember. It's exciting to know that God speaks to 11 and 12 year olds. It means he can still speak to us, he is still speaking to us. I was a teenager saved at camp, so I'm glad to know that I'm part of a church that believes in investing and still uh, supporting, sending our children, our teens. And I'm so thankful for the adults that gave of their time. And that, that might be me next year. I have a son who wants to go, and I'm getting a little old for that kind of thing, but I'm going to go. So we're going to give it a good, good, good try. But thank you for investing, as, as Pastor Mar said, in our children and in our teens. We have teens that are beginning to raise funds for an Nazarene Youth Conference next summer. And, and you're already giving through, through your regular tithes and offerings to support uh, their, their pursuit or as God chases after them. But there will be other opportunities as well for you to continue to, to invest. And you get to see a little bit of your return on your investment you, know, you invested in Alley for years. You get to see a little bit of the return on that investment. Uh, so, so don't if you ever wonder, is it worth giving? So yes, you get to see that today. So thank you. Today marks the fiftieth day, my fiftieth day as your pastor. Well, it's been fifty days already. Uh, you know, time really does fly when when you're having fun, and and, and I have been having fun, and, and I am enjoying what God is doing and and what He has. Um, brought us to as a family. I've uh, gotten to connect and get, getting to know many of you, uh, sharing life together, sitting in your homes, having some conversations out to lunch. It's, it's been a really enjoyable time for me these first several weeks and kind of listening and getting to know your story and how we might fit. Uh, admittedly, there was a few weeks that early on I'm thinking, well, Lord, where, where does my skill set, where, where do my giftings fit in this faith family? And he's starting to kind of reveal those, uh, where he's going to put these pieces together. And I won't share all those details with you, but as I get to know your story and see where the church has been and, and try to discern where God wants us to go, I'm beginning to see how he creatively is weaving things together, stitching us together, as we just finished several weeks ago, and in a way that only he can. Uh, however, I've discovered over these early weeks that uh, we need to update some information. 
And for some, I've, I've gotten returned cards that I've mailed because the address that we have maybe is, is incorrect or hasn't been updated. Or a few phone numbers I've called have been the wrong number, and well, I've had some good conversations with the wrong number. Uh, so I wasn't who I was trying to reach. So we would like, whether your information has changed or not, as you came in this morning, there was someone at the back table with one of these cards. We'd like for everyone to fill one of these out. Over the next month, you have to do it today, but take one with you. You can fill it out and bring it back later. Uh, if you do it now, it's obviously you know, not out of sight, out of mind. It'll be part of our weekly email that we send out as well. But we're just trying to update phone numbers, uh, addresses. Uh, I'd like to know when your birthdays are, your anniversaries are. I'd like to celebrate those with you, celebrate you on those very special days. So there's just some information we would like to uh, gather again. Uh, don't assume that we have your information or it's up to date or that it's, it's correct. So most of the time it is, but we want to make sure. So if everyone would please over the next, uh, oh, say four weeks, take some time to fill one of those cards out for you, your spouse, your family. That'll help us make sure that our database is correct. Uh, we won't sell your information unless the price is right. And um, I'm just kidding. We won't do that. So you won't be getting any, um, any spam calls and a connection to what you share with us. Uh, we, we do value that. that we, we do take that responsibility very seriously. But we would like for you to take some time to, to fill out that information. Because one of God's blessings uh, and, and to his creation to us is other people. It's family. It's friends. It's, it's a community to belong to, 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 that will encourage us. It will help us. And staying connected enables us to do life better together. So I want us to make sure that we can stay connected in, in the best way possible in our ever-changing culture today. As I look back, as I was looking at the children up front, I was reminded of those that invested in my life when, when I was a child. And I have this weird knack that I can remember all of my Sunday school teachers I remember Mrs. Twyman, who, when I was in kindergarten, uh, would come faithfully every Sunday, and she'd bring Starburst candies. And when you got out of her class, you didn't get any more Starburst candies. It was a very sad day. But then I got promoted to, to Mrs. Martin's class, and Mrs. Martin uh, would, would be my primary teacher. And I remember going to junior class with, with Mrs. Sloan and Mrs. Creasy, and we met in what we called the dungeon in my church uh, back in Fairmont. And I remember in, in that class having a peanut butter jar with a motorcycle glued to the top, and we would raise money for missionaries. I remember these people that invested in my life all the way up through junior high. Mr. Lawson and, 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 and Jeff Hott, who is now pastor himself, was, was my teen uh, leader and director. People that, that left me a trail to follow, modeled for me what faith looks like. On the surface, just ordinary people attending a small church in Fairmont, West Virginia. Normal jobs, parents themselves, grandparents perhaps. Normal marriages, some that you look at and you saw struggles, others where you saw them overcome great difficulty. Lives with ups and downs, much like ours. On the surface, they were just like us. But what made them stick out to me, what's made them stick into my memories was their faithfulness. There'd be times in, in my small church where they would come and I would be the only one in their class in my age group, yet they were still there for me. Some showed generosity, others modeled obedience. They taught me how to pray, how to respond, have conversations, and how to care. Ordinary people. The Bible is filled with ordinary people. Sometimes we look at the middle of the story or the end of the story and says, well, weren't that, that, they were just incredible people. And they became incredible, but they all started out as ordinary. Ordinary people poured into my life, and we are a part of a church here today of ordinary people. And over the next several weeks together, we're, we're going to talk about these ordinary stories and what God does when we give him permission and access to our lives, when we prepare ourselves for unknown moments to be used by him so that God can continue to do extraordinary things in our world even today. Some in Scripture were ready. They, they had done their homework. They were in the right place at the right time. Others were surprised, yet still willing to be used by God. And, and during our time in this, in this series over the next several weeks, we're going to share five stories, and there's so many more than five, of ordinary people that through extraordinary circumstances teach us about God but also about ourselves. And I hope that when we come together to worship, we don't only want to learn about him or to grow closer to him, but we allow God to teach us about ourselves as well. Because before God uses someone publicly, he's always shaping and molding and forming us privately. 
So this ordinary people conversation, I pray, will encourage us to recognize in ourselves what God already sees, what he already knows to be true. As we wrestle with who we are and who we're not yet, my hope is that we will see God is still preparing his people for appointed times, for anointed moments to fulfill ordained purposes. We're going to begin with one of the first stories that we share with others or was shared with us when we were children. The story of a man named Noah. It's a very familiar story. Undoubtedly, we've talked about it many times in children's church and Sunday school. Uh, there are, there's not anyone inside or outside the church who has not heard the story of Noah. Now, they might get some of the details wrong if, if they don't understand what Scripture is really saying. But we know who Noah is. We know that he was a man who built this very large boat at the time of a flood. And all of the animals got on the boat, and God saved the world through Noah. We want to jump to Hebrews chapter 11 as we begin. In Hebrews chapter 11, there's one verse that tells us something that we need to learn very, at the very beginning that tells us about the faith of this man named Noah, this, this ark builder. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. And by his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. So right away we see in Hebrews, Noah was a man of great faith. How great was his faith? Well, what was different about Noah's faith? Well, let's talk about that, because when we jump back to Hebrew, or back to Genesis chapter 6, we begin to see a story that I think many of us can kind of relate to, especially in the world that we live in today, but I don't yet think we have a full understanding and grasp of what was really going on in our world. In Genesis chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, we read about what's happening in the world that God's created. We're not too far removed from creation, but yet things very quickly... Are, Taken, have taken a wrong turn when once Adam and Eve made the decision to, to give in to temptation and, and to eat the fruit in the garden and to commit that first sin, an act of disobedience, that that first act opened literally, quote unquote, this floodgates, if you will, of what the world quickly became. In verse 1, when man began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God, so the daughters of men were beautiful and they married any of them that they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. His days will be 120 years. So God's looking at what's going on. He's not happy with, with what's happening. He's getting a little bit irritated. He says, oh, I'm going to have to number their days. Things aren't going the way that I thought that they would. But see, that's, that's what love does. God, love gives us free choice. Love gives us free will. God knew that. But he, he lets people choose, and he's still letting us choose today. But sometimes we don't choose the right thing. Jumping down to verse 5. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become. How wicked the earth had become. Every inclination of the thoughts of his, meaning man's heart, was only evil all the time. Now we think our world's pretty bad off today, don't we? I've had a lot of conversations, oh, don't you think God's coming back? Things are getting really terrible. He, he might be coming back soon. I don't know. Whether he comes back tomorrow or a thousand years from now, it doesn't change my purpose or my focus or, 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 or my routine. I should always care about those who don't know him yet. I should always be concerned about those who have drifted away from him. My daily mission doesn't change whether he comes back tomorrow or a thousand tomorrows because the world is not yet to this stage. So there's still hope. There's still those who need to be reached. There's still a message to be shared. Every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. Now, how bad is this? Well, God has surveyed the whole earth. He looked around. And he's grieved that he'd made man on the earth, verse 6 tells us. And his heart was filled with pain. Basically, the word grieve means he regrets. He regrets that he's created mankind. Wow pretty rough. It, 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 these, these are dark days on the face of the earth. So in verse 7, the Lord says, I will wipe mankind whom I've created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and birds of the air, for I am grieved that I've made them. But there's still hope. A few weeks ago, I talked how I love the, about, I love the big butts in the Bible. And, and, and in verse 8, we, we, we see one of those big butts in verse 8, but Noah, <laughs> but Noah, 
every, man, every inclination of man's heart was bent towards evil. The, the earth had become wicked. But Noah, one man, one family. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. I don't know how my life will unfold or what God has in store for me, uh, but if, if there's only one sentence ever written about my life, I pray that it's the same. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. I don't need to know much else. I, I know he's on the right track. I know that he's doing something right. And we finally see that, that, that there is hope. Even, even though God re- regrets what, what man is doing and what has happened, all have fallen away from God except for one. There is still one. Think about that. that this is how bad things have gotten. There's only one ray of light left in God's creation. Noah. We read in verse 9, this is the account of Noah and his family. And scripture goes on to talk about Noah. And it says, Noah was a righteous man. Blameless among the people of his time. And don't miss this. This is my focus this morning. And he walked faithfully with God. What is finding favor in God's eyes look like? What does being righteous when you are immersed in darkness look like? Walking faithfully with God. Every day, walking faithfully with God. We, we see that Noah walked with God. We know back in Genesis uh, chapter 3 that Adam and, and the account of Adam and Eve that God came to walk in the garden with his creation. We see now that Noah chose to walk with God. It was his choice. It was his decision. It was his lifestyle. This is significant when you understand what's going on around Noah, what he's surrounded by, the context in which he lives his life. Noah walked in step with God and out of step with the culture around him. I wonder how many today are trapped trying to keep in step with both God and culture, which you find out very quickly as they pull you in opposite directions. Eventually, you really do have to make a choice as to which you're going to follow. How many ark builders is God calling today that aren't willing to get out of step with the world? How many people is God speaking to that can't hear him because they're listening to so many other voices that are occupying their times? We cry out to God when we need him. We have struggles with our faith. Lord, what does it take for me to be faithful? We wonder why things are so difficult when all we have to do is really ask ourselves, who are we walking with every day? Who are we allowing to speak into our lives every day? We haven't even gotten to the ark yet. And here we learn something essential about Noah and his faith. Before God gave him one simple instruction, we know that Noah walked with God. Who are we walking with this morning? He was righteous. Blameless, Scripture tells us. He did not conform to the world in which he lived. It would have been so easy for him because everywhere he looked, every thought of man was bent towards evil. But Noah stayed faithful. Noah did not fit in. Noah found favor in God's eyes. Before cutting down a single tree, we know that Noah was living a life sort of in isolation. Probably a life of great pressure. One where every day he had to believe there was something. Every day he walked knowing more about God, more about himself. See, many of us understand that walking with God sometimes does bring pressure to one's life. If you've not felt that pressure yet uh, in our culture today, you soon will. Uh, we, we live in a world that is greatly, daily becoming more and more oppositional to the things of God, where, where living out one's faith becomes more challenging. We've gotten really good at uh, justifying or watering down or trying to make it likable, but that we're not called to make it likable. We're just called to live it out truthfully. And when a fleshly, carnal world uh, be, be begins to walk in opposition to us, we, we have a decision to make. Who are we going to follow? Who are we going to walk with? Noah's yet to be seen as crazy and foolish. He's yet to pound one single nail, and he's already walking in opposition to a, the entire world. But then God tells Noah his plan. Remember Hebrews chapter 11 says, being warned of God. God tells Noah what's about to happen. I, I, I'm about to, 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 to it, it's going to rain, Noah. Imagine this conversation. Noah, it's going to rain. What's well, rain? 
I'm going to flood the earth. What's a flood? Uh, I, I, I want you to build an ark. Build a what? An ark. What's an ark? And, and, and Noah gets these instructions from God, and he does something incredible. In, in my mind, he gets to work. And he starts building. He doesn't know what rain is. He know what it means. He doesn't know what a flood is. There's no reason for there to be a flood in all creation because it hasn't rained yet. He doesn't even know what an ark is. But Noah gets to work. He doesn't know how long it's going to take. He doesn't know how much money it's going to cost. He, he doesn't know what might happen once he's built the ark and it starts to rain. He just knows that he walks with God and God's asked him to do this and Noah just does it. Do you hear from God? I'm glad for Jillian's testimony this morning. She hears from God. Do you walk with him? See, the reality is we, we have to, to get closer to God, we have to get closer to God in order to hear his voice. And, and when we're able to hear his voice, he's usually pretty clear. The question is, do we have the faith to act on it? So God faithfully gives Noah directions. He tells him the dimensions of the ark that he's to build. He tells him what, what he's to do with it. He, he tells him that, that he wants it to look a certain way, a certain, certain length, certain height. We won't get into all those details today because that's not the important part of what I want to get to this morning. But he gives Noah these instructions. And, and Noah, you have to understand, we believe at this time Noah is in uh, Mesopotamia, kind of the Middle East. And, and most likely he's a hundred miles in either direction of an ocean or a sea. The rivers that are, are nearby, uh, we, talk, we see them in Scripture, the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers, they're not deep enough to handle a boat of this size. So Noah's being instructed to build this boat in the middle of nowhere with no water in which to float it. It's a good lesson for us. God tells you to do something that doesn't make sense, that seems strange or impossible, or is laughable by those around you in it and outside the church. Perhaps God is going to do something big. And God told Noah it was going to rain 120 years before the first drop fell. 120 years. 120 years. Look at what God's up to. Verse 14. To make yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. Coat it with pitch. The word pitch is a Hebrew word kapar. Kapar means to cover or to, to purge or to, to, to seal. It's the same root word that we see in the word atonement. To forgive. So God tells Noah, cover the ark in pitch. Cover it for the, for, so that you will be safe, so the ark doesn't leak, so water doesn't come in and, and so that you don't sink and drown, so you will find salvation. It's the same word that we see then used for Jesus Christ when he came to atone for our sins, to cover us, again, with pitch, only this time his pitch is the blood of Christ, covering us so that we could be saved and not drown and not perish. We see Christ even in Genesis chapter 6 if we look close enough. God gave Noah other instructions, other instructions, and we see in verse 22, Noah did everything just as God commanded him meaning that he continued to walk in step with God. He committed to, com continued to do what God wanted him to do. Noah completed his work. Yes, it took time, a lot of time, 120 years worth of time. Some of us can't even imagine 120 days from now. Noah spent 120 years. He completed the ark. And while he was wor at work, Noah continued to walk with God. I don't want to get too hung up in some of the nuances of this story but some of us can relate to Noah, or we do relate to Noah, where we recognize it or not in different ways. Some of us, well, we might have gotten these instructions from God, and we just wouldn't have started at all. It would have just been too big for us, too overwhelming. We, we, we couldn't even possibly imagine what it might look like. So we wouldn't have started. We call those never starters. We wouldn't even have bothered because it's just too big. It's impossible. It doesn't make any sense. God, why would you have me do that? It just, it's illogical. What might people think? What might people say? We're going to make up all these excuses, and we just don't even bother doing what it is that God wants us to do to begin with. Because it just sounds so crazy. You read the story, and it does sound that way, doesn't it? But when you walk with God, what sounds crazy or out of line or, or just ridiculous to the world doesn't seem to matter so much when you're walking with him. 
If you're not a never starter, perhaps you're a, a start but don't finisher. <laughs> got any unfinished home improvement jobs at your house? Yeah, I got a few of those too. I've only been there five weeks, so I have an excuse. What's your excuse? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> You know, we're partially obedient. All right, Lord, we're all excited about that. Let's jump right in. And before you know it, the bathroom's gutted, and then a year later, it's still gutted. You started, but we don't finish. We're all gang-ho. We're excited. We just, with great enthusiasm, jump into the work God has for us, and then we realize, oh, this is hard. Or I'm not equipped for this. Or this costs me more than I thought it would. And before long, we've kind of given up on it, and it just sits there just sits there. We start, but we don't finish. Partially obedient, but not fully. We began by walking with God, but maybe at some point in time we gave up. Take, take that home improvement project and apply it to your spiritual life. You started it and not finished? Good news is it's not too late to go pick up the hammer to get back to work. See, Noah was given instructions to build without knowing how, what, or where. How will I navigate? How will I steer this thing? Where, where are we going to go? How long will I be in the ark? How long is it going to float? Where, when we are done floating, where are we going to land? Well, what's life going to look like on the other side of the flood? Lord, there's a lot of questions I have. But Noah didn't ask, and God didn't give him the answers. Yet Noah was still obedient. So 120 years later, the rain began. Now that first day, let's just imagine. Never seen this before. Water starts falling from the sky. Hey, that's kind of cool. What is that? But a week later, it's not cool anymore. You've had enough. Two weeks, one month, 40 days, all of a sudden. Can you imagine being in the ark? See, Noah not only walked with God, he walked with God right up into that ark, and God shut the door behind him, and now it's starting to rain, it's storming. People are pounding on the door, let me in, let me in. Not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. You've had 120 years to, to, to get on board, and you, you still have rejected God because your hearts have been inclined towards evil in every way. But now they want saved. Maybe a little bit of uncertainty by Noah, perhaps. We, we might think that way, but Noah walked with God. He trusted God up to this point. Why wouldn't he trust God on the ark? Uncertainty, sure. A lot of things unknown, absolutely. But he walked with God anyway. There's times in our own lives we grow weary of walking because we can't see the destination. We want immediate answers. But God doesn't always give those. God never gave Aunt Noah some of the answers that he wanted. Rather, Noah had to simply experience them. And in so doing, found a faithful God, the same God that he walked with. See, one man in step with God was saved. The world was wrong. Might walking with God cost us? Yeah, it might. Maybe friends, maybe status, maybe position. But see, we know how the story ends. The rains came, the waters rose. In our world today, the same thing is, is eventually going to happen in, in a different context. God is going to come back. Jesus will return. I found myself as I was writing and preparing this thought. I, and I wondered, I still wonder, is obedience a choice? Or is obedience a product of our walk? A reflection of who we walk with? A byproduct of our relationship with God? See, when I'm walking with him, when I'm in step with him, I don't really have to think about being obedient. I just do it. It just comes natural. It's just what I do. If we're in fellowship, and this is from Oswald Chambers, we're in fellowship and oneness with God and recognize that he's taking us into his purposes, then we no longer strive to find out what his purposes are. We don't need all the answers because we're walking in fellowship and oneness with him. We just trust him, knowing he's not going to lead us astray, knowing he's going to take care of us. In other words, if we have a purpose of our own, it destroys the simplicity and the calm, relaxed pace with which we should be showing as children of God. Because we're wanting answers that we really don't need to have. When we have a trust in a heavenly father who's proven himself faithful, this act of faith, this act of obedience, this choosing to obey God is motivated by our love for God. It's influenced by how closely we walk with God. 
So through the example of Noah, let's hear how we wrap things up this morning. Some pretty challenging questions. Who are we in step with? Who do you walk with? Whose approval are you seeking? Noah teaches us that when we walk with God, God not only walks with us, but stands with us. Because church, we live in dark days still. We live in the midst of a society that is out of step with God. Not just out of step with him, but arrogantly so, proudly so. Condemnation comes to all who choose to walk this path, following the call to evil. But there's good news. Faith, our faith, your faith is still a work in progress. We are still growing, and we still can make a choice today to walk with God. Surround yourself with others who have faith, whatever that might look like in in, in different ways in your life. Those who choose to walk with God, ordinary people, follow them. I I have no doubt the Holy Spirit's been speaking, and, and you know, we know, those in our lives that we've let have influence that are perhaps leading us down the wrong path or those that we should be following or emulating or or trying to be like. God's pointing those things out very clearly to us right now. The question is, what will we do when we leave this place? It's easy to be faithful here. It's much harder when our time together finishes in the mornings. So who are you in step with? Who are you walking with? I invite you to stand. And we're going to pray. I'm going to pray for you and over you. And these early days together, I hope you're getting a feel for, for my heart and, and what matters, what's important. It, they're, they're, I, I love God's word. I love digging a little deeper. I, I love peeling back the layers. I love sharing that with you. But it's not complicated. It's right there. We all can read it. What made ordinary Noah not so ordinary? He walked with God. It's something each and every one of us can choose to do today. Father, we love you. We say that. Now, Lord, I pray today that we would mean that. Love is reflected in, in our response to you, in, in our, the time that we choose to spend with you, in, in our priorities and how they, they perhaps, hopefully, Lord, are, are bent towards you or, or are directed by you, God. And I pray this morning that you would help us to have an honest conversation, perhaps, with ourselves. Who is it that we're walking with? Who are we following? We read this story of Noah, and and we've known it for so long. We know the details, Lord. It it almost sounds too good to be true, and Lord, it is true. It did happen. But before any of, of, of the building of this incredible ark happened, before the floods came, Lord, Noah walked with you. He found favor in your eyes. And God, I pray that we would live a life that finds favor in your sight. That might mean we need to leave today and change a few things. Readjust our schedules or our priorities or our interests. We might need to delete a few things or turn off a few channels to get back in line and get back in step with you. God, these are hard conversations. Maybe they're humbling. But I pray we wouldn't be afraid of them. Lord, the consequences are too high. The reality is that there is no middle ground. There's no walking with with both. We're either walking with you or we're walking away from you. And I pray today, Lord, we would choose as your people to walk with you. What does that look like? Well, spend a little more time with you, give you an opportunity to speak into our lives, getting to know who you are, giving you room to speak and, and to show us perhaps areas in our lives that we need to change. Father, I pray. The world has certainly changed. We, we don't have 120 years left ourselves. But we do have time to make a choice. And I pray, Father, your spirit would bring us back. Those who have wandered, those who have never started, might they choose to today. Or those that have started but not finished, Lord, I pray that you would help us to, to, to get back in, in line again, to pick up the hammer and get back to work today. Lord, those who are in the process of completing faithfully their work, Lord, would you give us the endurance and the strength, the perseverance that we need. So that, Lord, each one of us could be defined by a beautiful, powerful statement. But they walked with God. They found favor in God. God's eyes. If that's the only thing that ever describes me, Lord, I'll be happy and content with that. I 
pray, Lord, we'd be people who seek your favor. God, be honored and glorified in how we go about your business as we leave this place. We're sent people for your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Go. You're sent. Walk after him. Be amazed at where he sends and takes you.